we discussed how we can make our cities more resilient as more and more people move to the cities for the opportunities, for the jobs, for a better life. And as they move there, and as they become more prosperous, people start consuming more. And that is wonderful. It's a positive development that they're getting ahead in life, they're moving ahead. However, this, this adds more stresses to the cities and adds to the challenges that they have to address, not least of which is um, that they have to prepare for this population growth and the pressures it's putting on our ecosystems and natural resources. How do they do that? Well, more people consuming means more production, means more use of finite natural resources. So now I'd like to introduce the chair of this panel, which is going to look at those solutions. Uh, the chair is Ambassador C. Das Gupta. Please welcome. Uh, he is a distinguished fellow of the Terry Institute and also the former ambassador of India to the EU, Belgium, and Luxembourg, and his heart is in these issues. And he's joining us now to chair this important panel. Welcome. And welcome to our participants. Please join us here on the stage. Uh, this session is devoted to the central question, not only in the, on the issue of climate change, but the question, the larger question of sustainable development. And that is sustainable production and sustainable consumption. Now, perhaps I should begin by clarifying an issue on which there's a certain amount of confusion in discussions on sustainable production and sustainable consumption. And that is the widespread misbelief that sustainable consumption uh, uh, involves a reduction in living standards. It does not. It, uh, it concerns not so much the total quantum as the distribution, the composition of consumption. Uh, countries at the same level or comparable levels of per capita income or per capita consumption can have widely divergent per capita emission figures. For example, North America as compared to, let's say, Switzerland. Uh, there's no huge difference in living standards and per capita consumption standards, but there is a big difference in the composition of consumption. And so we'll be considering the question of per capita consumption, which is extremely important, and of course, uh, sustainable production patterns. Uh, we have very, uh, three very eminent panelists today. His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah bin Hamad al Latia, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Qatar and the President of the Administrative Control and Transparency Authority of Qatar, who has done so much not only for the development of Qatar as a global energy hub, but also as a partner for India in building up our energy infrastructure. Uh, we have Mr. Ruud Lubbers, the former Prime Minister of the Netherlands and a distinguished member of the Club de, pa de Madrid. And finally, Lord Prescott, uh, a former Deputy Prime Minister and a member of the House of Lords. So may I invite Mr. Uh, Hamad al Atiyah to make the initial presentation? Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today in the historic city of New Delhi and this warm, welcoming venue. It's indeed an honor to be among such group of individuals who are leading the drive of sustainable development and shaping the way forward in addressing global climate change. At the, at the outset, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to, who, to all who have worked to organize this important event on sustainable development. 
In particular, I would like to thank Dr. B. Pachori, the Director General of the Energy Resource Institute. We were honored to have Dr. Pachori speak in Doha just a few years ago, and I greatly appreciate his invitation to attend this summit. We are gathering here today because we share a common concern about the impact of the unsustainable use of our resource on climate change. Equally is an important, we have come together because we share a common responsibility to the well-being of a future generation. To address these concerns on a national level, the government of Qatar, under the wise leadership of His Highness the Emir of, the, of Qatar, has approved and adopted in 2011 an ambitious long-term strategy for the sustainable development of the country. The leadership in Qatar is committed to work diligently with other governments in building a global consensus around sustainable development goals and climate change policies. The global economy is, go is going through unprecedented economic growth. Although the economic growth has lifted millions from poverty, however, the current model coupled with rapid population growth in certain regions of the world has resulted in growing pressures on the limited resource on Earth. There, there are no better words to characterize this uh, grave issues other than the wise words of the great Indian leader, Mahamata Gandhi, who said, Earth has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Indeed, Earth has enough resources to, satis to satisfy the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But we must be broadened in how we use these resources. We must come together to make fundamental changes in how we produce and how we consume. As we meet the needs of our societies, if our societies continue on a path of greed, the growing pressures in our limited resource will lead to a, a widening divide between, divided between the rich and poor and cause irreparable damages to the environment. It is therefore incumbent, open to you, to us, to work together to reserve this destructive course. We need to work collectively to eliminate or at least to mitigate the harmful outcomes of the unsustainable practices in the production and the consumption of goods and services. Fortunately, this summit has brought together some of the greatest minds and committed leaders from cross economic sectors, scientific institution, and civil society in an effect in an effort to facilitate the exchange of knowledge and thoughts on these in this in these press, uh, pressing issues. So let us take advantage of this opportunity and work together to develop policies that will make a difference. Let us commit here to move forward, building our work on the principles and policies of a previous agreements, such as the Johannesburg Declaration on Sustainable Development. And 
and, and the 10-year framework of program of sustainable production and consumption adopted at Rio Plus 20 conference. It's time that we transition from our, our global consensus on, on moral positions on issues of climate change and sustainable development to solutions that are more practical. Uh, as the former president of the Doha Cup 18 CMP8, I'm quite aware of the serious challenges lying ahead as we work to search a consensus on uh, in corporate visions to address this climate change. This consensus will require that we work hard to narrow the gap that exists between the public and corporate visions. I be, try to be a more clear and a more, you know, to speak to you from the heart to the heart. My experience as president of Cup 18 in Qatar, it gave me a lot of confused. I'm a man who came from the energy sector. I worked all my career more than 40 years in the energy sectors. I was, as Qatar, we are small oil producer, we are, but we are a big gas producers. And this is our challenge, how to, you know, to, to relate, you know, uh, environmental and, you know, hydrocarbon productions. I was, you know, in the, in the a, Cup 18, as president, I tried, and I thought, all this gathering, 192 countries, more than 15,000 people participants of all over the world, come to Doha for two weeks. We worked a night and a day, almost 20, uh, 22 hours a day, to trying to bring the world for an agreement. Then I, I was saying to myself, now I find out, yes, the address is a climate change conference, but when I go deep, there is no climate change. It's only a politics and interest. And this is why, you know, it's turned all these cups to a politician's arena. And we, we don't understand how the big players, they are not part of the agreement. And then we find out that big, you know, the most big players in the world, the biggest producer of emission, they are not part of the agreement. So we tried, in the end of the day, in the end, after two, uh, two weeks of, of the conference, to how to just to introduce to the world what they call it a text. And then we say, okay, we will see you in Warsaw. Then we will see you in, P in Lima. Then next, this year we will see you in Paris. And I hope that the world should understand that the climate change is effective and it's effective in consumption, production, it will affect in all over, you know, the reason. I hope that, that the politicians should understand this is another way of protecting also the end. I understand, because when I was discussed with one of the big country who are not part, I say, you should sacrifice he told me, don't give me a gun and ask me to shoot my leg. Is my interest, my country interest. So I hope that all these discussions, I hope that the whole, because I know there is a big difference between academic, scientific, and politicians. Politicians can't speak long hours. At the end of the day, you will not understand what he tried to say. And the scientific, he wants the solution now, not tomorrow. And also, this is not a pragmatic. So how we can bring pragmatic and 
dreams because it will take years because you cannot stop sustainable development. And in the same time, especially in the developed countries. In 2002-06, I have another experience. I was elected as president of the Sustainable Development Conference in the United Nations. I spent days, weeks in New York, in the United Nations, to deal with governmental, non-governmental, uh, and in the end of the day, we try and we still we have a dream. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. It's great to be here. Of course, I'm here on the invitation of uh, organization Pachari. Worked with him many, many years. And when I see this 15th <coughs> Delhi Sustainable Development Summit, I'm aware that this year, 15 years, is exactly the same year that we will celebrate 15 years Earth Charter. I'm not only a man of energy, but also of the Earth Charter. That's a civil society document. We're going to celebrate 15 years. Now you see there as well sustainable development goals. Yes, in 2000 it was only millennium. Now it's sustainable. And in Paris, it's specific on the climate change. It's there too. I think it's a special year. I'm going to explain that a little bit, because why it is such a special year. I allow myself to start there first, beyond the Paris thing, in Europe, my continent. We have a new team there in Europe, a new president of the commission and a new president of the council, and these two guys have decided together to go finally, eventually now, for one energy union. They have concluded energy is so key for our continent that we should stop to be fragmented and to realize really one union. And two reasons for that. One is the climate change. We come to the conclusion that it is so key that if we want a green economy, then we should unite, be one. It's now the, the priority of Europe. The second reason is a very political one, because after all this mess with the euro and the banking crisis, we have now the Putin crisis. What is the Putin crisis? Putin crisis is that our big neighbor, Russia, is tempted to play games with European countries because they are fragmented. So we have decided politically, Mr. Putin, we want to be with you, but you have to be, understand one thing, no games as he started to do more and more. So this is the second reason for a energy union. Just a few points on this in the European dimension. For the climate change, we need the union, and for Russia, we need the union. And it brings me to a few other points. When I take stock today, you saw that from Mr. Pachari, who is a very objective, the temperature is rising faster than we expected. So the problem is bigger. We are in a hurry. At the very same time, I'm convinced that technologically there are enormous possibilities and it goes quicker and quicker. So the ambition can be filled in with substance. So this is at this, this very moment the case. Uh, I see signals from the business community and from many NGOs that there is no choice anymore between the environment and the economy and the jobs, but that they go one, one hand in hand. And that's, of course, the good news at this moment. This is my next remark. Still, is a long way to go. That's obviously clear for all of you. 
another remark. For the first time, we heard about a few months ago about the G2 environment. This is then the United States of America and China. It reminds me that only six years ago in Copenhagen, we had a disaster, we Europeans, because we wanted to, to go forward with a CO2 poor economy. And those two big countries both said, we are not very interested in it. And now you see that exactly these two are going forward, which is great. I think, uh, why? And I'll give you this clue. China was so successful in its economy the last decade that they have seen more and more that it is hurting the health of the Chinese people, the health itself, mainly in the cities, of course, but it is a national problem. So they don't think any longer that the climate change is the problem of the rich world. It is as well of the developing world. So that is an essential new element. Now allow me, myself as I am, and I have been to go a bit back in my own history. When I started my life, he talked about the G2, this capitalist United States and still communist China. When I grew up, this was the division of the world. You had capitalist countries, you had socialist countries, and you had the non-aligned countries. One of my best friends when I went into politics was a lady from this country, Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi was considered as the informal leader of the non-aligned countries. It brings me to the thought, yes, indeed, interesting, G2, America, China, but what about all those other countries? Is there not a role for India itself? To give an example, but also some leadership. And I would appreciate that. And there is an enormous potential, I think. India should not be too modest in the world. In its own country, they will achieve on climate change. And they give examples to many other countries in the world. Because we cannot simply say it's either America or it's China. So these were a few things I wanted to share with you. Do I have still one minute? Okay. I take that one minute uh, for a message of hope. Uh, many awful things happening in the world. Still there are opportunities. The most important, of course, is to live up to that message which was said earlier our common future. It's all about our common future. But we are reaching the point that we have to make that visible in the world. We can be quite different in these countries, but we have one common future. So how do we do this? This is by hard working, by being rational, by not fighting, but joining. Yeah, but it begins with respect for each other. That tolerance, people, spoken about this this morning, to respect nature, our responsibility for the earth. So I end not with a um, diplomatic message, but to wish you the joyful celebration of life. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I've been involved in these environmental negotiations since 1997, when as the lead negotiator, I completed for Europe and for the globe the Kyoto Agreement. I've attended every COP since then, and this is my fourth visit to this wonderful conference that takes place here. I want to comment on the, my experience from that, because we're only 10 months away from finding that agreement at Paris, and we must find that agreement at Paris. And I have been through all those negotiations, through the night, sometimes we get some advances, sometimes we don't. I hope this time you have to get the agreement. And indeed, what I want to talk about particularly is this business of sustainability.
and sustainable production it's got here. But sus production means so many different things to different people. Sustainable production can mean business as usual. We don't believe that means sustainability. It's a very threat to sustainability itself. But in a way, the opinion has grown now that almost split between North and South, which has constantly been there, the increasing inequalities that are existing in our economy, where the rich are getting richer in the countries and the poor are getting poorer. And that's the reality, despite all these negotiations. Now, what I want to say is that's almost reflected in two bodies. We meet here in the first week of, um, of uh, February. Davos, the home of the rich, meet in January, the end. And what's interesting, it reflects all the CEOs. I don't know how many people here went to Davos. Can I ask you how many went to Davos? Well, there are. There's an answer. That what they talk about in Davos is the sustainability as business as usual. How can we keep on going? How can we lift up the economy? In fact, last year, they actually made a decision, not much about the environment, they made a decision that they were going to drill for oil in the Arctic. Well, since everybody knows, and the scientists are commonly telling us, that eight times the amount of oil and resources lie on the ground, eight times greater than we can afford to burn if we are to keep that commitment to climate change, which is about the increase in climate temperatures. The world signs up for that, and then they bury off down to Davos and come to a separate agreement, because what they mean by sustainability, they mean sustainability of business as usual. How do we get the interest rates down? Well, even this year, they, they went to cyber security. Well, it's very important, hardly anything to do with the poverty in most of the world, the inequalities, the problems for, coming from failing to do anything about climate change. Now, what they are arguing, of course, is about growth, and we're arguing about growth. But we have the essential point, as always been said here in New Delhi at this conference, you can't get sustainable growth unless you deal with the issue of climate change and the problems that come from that. So there's two schools of thought, and we've got 10 months to bring them together. Now, I don't know whether New Delhi could arrange for Davos and, and the New Delhi conference here to be a meeting of minds, but all the people who are making those decisions will be involved in the decisions at Paris. That's what worries me. Now, I've seen it near breakdown once before. Copenhagen. I was there when it happened, and it's just been mentioned. And Copenhagen actually collapsed because it didn't have proper direction. But more than that, it didn't have the full support of people. They were divided about the issue. And what we're different to Kyoto now is that was 40 industrial countries. We're now talking about 191 with a growing inequality between the richer part and the poorer part or the north and south of our uh, global economy. So I think what we have to do is to bear in mind that this issue of sustainability, we have still to win the argument. Sustainability means what our scientists have told us, if we continue with business as usual, burning the carbon at the rate we do, then we will face the consequences which they've predicted for long enough of which we have to take account. And I would congratulate Dr. Pachari. His scientist group and the OPPC have produced a wonderful piece of work. I'm pleased to hear he's thinking of other work now that that work might not be uh, completed. But the environment argument is still, still the issue. The scientists have proven, and most, the greater majority accept it, the big issue now is political will. Have we got the political will to make the kind of changes that are necessary to achieve the sustainable growth that we talk about, where growth has to be accompanied with the environmental changes to avoid the catastrophe that is posed for us. So that to me is the big challenge, and I worry as this begins to limit at Kyoto, we had the various um, oil interests, I hope my colleague doesn't mind, various steel, coal, and all those came and told us, don't do this, it's nonsense. But we managed to get that agreement on Kyoto. Now the interests are still there wanting to play a part, but they're more embodied with maintaining their interests, not the global one. Global means to them is bigger markets to produce more, to make more money. So there is a real conflict of interest here if we are to solve this problem of Paris. Let me make clear in regard to Paris, we have to get the agreement 
today. There's no doubt about it. 2015 will be the most significant milestone in these arguments. And therefore, what we have to do is make sure that Paris is full supported. Not Fabius, who came along here and told us and gave us a framework of what he th thinks needed to be done. I'm pleased to hear a leader who's going to be responsible at the time of the Paris Agreement talking in the language that we think is important. Namely, it has to be universal. It's not for a few at the cost of the many. Namely, we have to look at the technology. We have to change our kind of production, look at our consumption patterns. These are very important and difficult issues to deal with, but more so when you have to do it with 191 countries. So I hope we can give him that full support. Political support means everybody here actually playing a part, because you all play them in your own countries, in your own regions, and we've got to make that position clear. Act on those who are doing the negotiation, get together to get that agreement. France is going to play a very important part, and we have to give them the full support so they're speaking for all of us in them forums that have to make these difficult decisions. That, to me, is the biggest issue to be faced. Now, I would say there are some issues that are good. It's been mentioned that China, America, and Europe got together on some of the gas cuts. Great, that's a step forward. We're now talking about the money, as the other speakers have thought. You better find the money for that to deal with adaption and uh, mitigation, which is very critical. And we have to recognize the UN principle about the uh, fair share based on the UN principles of uh, uh, common but differentiated and responsibilities. That's a very big issue, a big issue if we're going to solve it. So we need to deal with it, the money for adaption, etc. So. My time is up. I just want to say, though, we have to move her from having the debates about the individual issues to find a global agreement. It's about governance. It's about morality. It's about what's right. And we are on the side there. I'm proud to have been associated here with Terry and this conference. But historically, I think I should say, and it always impressed me, A, we've got to support the French in Paris, and we'll do all we can for that. But you know, the 19th century of our economy was concerned with production. In the 20th century, we've been concerned with consumption. In the 21st century, we better start getting contained with about sustainability. Sustainability that saves our planet recognizes the climate change uh, and, uh, problems for the economy, all which this institution has been saying for years. Many congratulations to them. Now we have to find the political pressure to see that it's delivered. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard three okay. very eloquent and very weighty presentations on the question of sustainable production and consumption patterns. There were two messages which emerged loud and clear uh, from the presentations which we had today. The first message was about sustainability, the, the nature of the problem. Uh, the first speaker, His Excellency Mr. Abdullah bin Hamad al Atiyah, pointed to the lesson which Gandhi held before us, that the earth has enough to meet everyone's needs, but not to satisfy every, everyone's greed. And that was the essence, the heart of the problem of sustainability. The next speaker, His Excellency Mr. Lubbers, put the same point across in a somewhat different way when he pointed to the need to work together to achieve and safeguard our common future. And Lord Prescott, speaking last, again pointed to another dimension of sustainability, explaining that sustainability is not the same as business as usual. Sustainable production is not the same as business as usual production. And the difference between the two uh, is, the, is the crux of the matter. The second point which emerged was uh, with reference to the climate negotiations that are ongoing. Clearly, there's a need for an uh, agreement, not merely an agreement, but an equitable and ambitious agreement at Paris. And each of the three speakers we had 
drew concrete lessons from their own experiences in negotiations. Uh, uh, his Excellency Mr. Abdullah bin Hamad al Atiyah shared with us his insights as president of the Qatar COP. And then Mr. Lubbers pointed to some of the pitfalls in negotiations of the type that we witnessed in Copenhagen and to the need to avoid these pitfalls and to move ahead. And finally, Lord Prescott shared with us the, the lessons that are to be drawn from Kyoto. And uh, these, I think, were very valuable. They were mutually reinforcing calls for a successful outcome at Paris. Uh, uh, we've run out of time now, ladies and gentlemen, and with this, I'll bring this session to a close. Please join me in giving a hand to our three distinguished panelists. <laughs>